day. I, I say the, the danger of being the, uh, the last speaker uh, of a series of four on the just energy transition is that a lot of the stuff is covered by the previous three speakers and probably more eloquently than, than, than I will. However, I will... Uh, I guess I'm going to give a position really from a... and I'll call it from a disruptor's view um, and mainly um, around the experiences, I think, in two parts. One, uh, the experience I've had over the last 18 months of having to be involved in, in efforts in South Africa to try and uh, understand what a just energy transition is. Um, and actually, you'll probably see there's a lot of confusion rather than, than consensus. Uh, and I think from, um, and I guess from my own experience, as I say, I think um, uh, my, uh, a lot of this experience comes through the fact that I've been the, that I was the vice chair of the uh, Solar Association and on SAREC for many years. And, uh, and because of that, I've been sort of, dragged into a number of fora, uh, particularly around BUSA, um, NEDLAC, and uh, around uh, how we're going to deal with renewable energy within uh, an energy transition. So I'm going to give you kind of some of those experiences of what I've seen, as much as I can say. And, and, and I think also what we did as an industry to, to try and realise that we, we need to play a kind of a different role if we are going to become a legitimate part of the, of the energy mix and a just transition. Um, so the first thing I, I found since was, uh, I, particularly since NASREC and, uh, and over the last year, is the phrase just energy transition has become part of the lexicon of all of the stakeholders, you know, government, labour, civil society and business. However, uh, what you've tended to do is when you kind of ask those groups what it actually means, uh, they seem very much lost for words and it's actually becomes quite a complex issue. Um, so uh, I myself did what most people do is uh, go and look at uh, Wikipedia to see what the uh, definition is. Um, and uh, what it seemed was a just transition, and I think this is where just energy transition really kind of emanated from, uh, apparently came from indigenous tribes but then uh, agreed, co-opted by labour, um, really to, to look at, I, I guess, a series of, um, I guess, socioeconomic and support um, initiatives that would need to come in to support a transition to lower carbon technologies. When it, when it comes to just energy transition, you actually can't find any formal definition of what a just energy transition is. And, um, but it's used, uh, it's been sloganised. Uh, and it's used very freely that uh, the, tra the transition in energy transition in South Africa can't happen unless it's just. Um, but that's as far as the understanding from, from stakeholders is. Uh, and to say, uh, what do stakeholders say about the just energy transition? And I think, as you see, from, from, from government side, uh, it's a core principle sitting within the, um, the National Development Plan. Uh, it's, it's also now embedded in the... Uh, in the ANC manifesto, so it's seen as something that, that is a, a, a given. Business uh, and uh, says that just you know, any transition of, of the energy sector must be just, but no plan. I think as business, what they do see though is that renewable energy certainly plays a role uh, in, in mine closure as an alternative, um, uh, alter so alternative intervention, and, and also it, it, plays a, it can play a big role in the transition of mining economies kind of post-operational close. Labour, and it's a question of which part of Labour you speak to, but le let me say within, I would say, the, um, uh, the NEDLAC framework of Labour, and I will have agree with uh, the misgivings about what that represents, uh, it's very clear that they see that coal must play a major role still in the energy mix and nuclear. Um, but they see it as government and businesses' responsibility to come up with plans on any kind of transition um, and, uh, and really not for them to play uh, a role in that. What we find, again, informal um, community um, representation around this discussion. Uh, again, coal must remain part of the energy mix. We have 200 years' worth of coal, apparently. Um, and also, uh, they're less worried about the kind of implications short term of those environmental aspects. However, 
what you tend to find is when you talk to communities, when you actually talk to, uh, let's say, uh, for, uh, actual labour workers, you get a different position. Uh, but what you tend to see is a lot of, I think, um, a lack of coherence in people's understanding of it. Let's say when you go to government departments, we see huge arguments between DMR, DEA. Okay, DMR wants more coal, clean coal. DEA wants much stronger, um, stronger commitments on decarbonisation. When it comes to business, okay, it becomes very, uh, let's call it, um, we'll call it nuanced. Okay, we've, we've seen recently, you know, in terms of Standard Bank has come out and made very clear, uh, and Ned Bank, sorry, Ned Bank, uh, very clear um, views about their, their, about not, in, you know, essentially supporting um, coal IPPs, but they still support coal mines. So what you tend to see is, again, not a coherent view from business. Uh, when I've talked to Labour, they know the transition is coming. They know they're not prepared for it. Okay, without significant reskilling. When you talk to communities on the ground, particularly those in Mpumalanga, sorry, um, they hate coal. They want to they move away from coal. However, what you tend to find in, in mining communities is that coal trumps everything. So even though they may come up with alternative solutions around land use, you tend to find if it's, you know, you know, if it's, if it's going to be affected by mining, it, it won't happen. And, and I think you tend to find communities feel that they are not consulted and they're not represented around these issues. And certainly, they're not being skilled or re-educated for the process. So, as I say, what you end up with is a somewhat confused picture. I guess the outcome of it is we suffer, uh, and I'll make some observations. You see political and institutional inertia. As I say, we tend to I call it, suffer holy cows quite gladly. In, in the sense that we will, um, we will make very clear statements about coal must play part of the energy mix, but we, we must decarbonise. Uh, we suffer a lot, and we're seeing it recently, of what I call ESCOM cognitive dissonance um, syndrome, where it doesn't matter really okay, what kind of, uh, whatever objective facts you put on the table for the fact that ESCOM um, must change. Okay, uh, you tend to find that it, it, it sits outside of the mindset and the worldview that most of our, I would say, our stakeholders' view is of ESCOM as having played a historical major role, either for business, for government, okay, for labour, and the inability to actually, I think, come up with innovative and new ways to, to deal with it. I think also the just energy transition has somewhat been captured by the coal sector, so it as it rightly so, it ends up becoming more about how do I save coal jobs and how do I save the Mpumalanga regional economy. And, and in our, our view, or my view certainly, it needs to become something that becomes relevant, just as relevant um, to an agricultural worker uh, around Freiburg who's suffering because of drought that's happening around there as it is to a mine worker. But, but it, at the moment, it's been very narrow, narrowly defined around that. I think the other part, there's no, uh, there's no coherent plan. Uh, there's no, I would say, implementable plan for a just energy transition. I don't think it's one plan, but I don't think there is something you can put on the table that someone can say, this is a just energy transition plan and this is the role I play in it. I think that's a particular problem for labour. So you tend to find plans are all very macro. So as a, as a renewable energy industry, we'll always say, yes, we'll create twice as many jobs as will be lost in coal. But you don't see any micro plans. You don't see any bottom-up plans that actually says to a, a coal worker at Hendrina, this is where you will be going, this is how you will be trained, this is the interventions that you will see as part of a just energy transition plan. And I guess uh, the, the table on the right is the, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum uh, table on energy transition preparedness. And as you can see, we are um, pretty much at the bottom. Apparently, only Haiti is, uh, is uh, least, le uh, less prepared for the energy transition uh, than we are, uh, which is a shame, really. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a disruptor's view, and I, maybe just quickly to say, I mean, how I got involved uh, in being involved or having to think about solutions around the just energy transition, I think goes back to kind of 2016 when I was part of MACE and um, the Minister of Energy at the time 
uh, tried to put in front of the, the, the council um, an IRP that had uh, 25,000 megawatts of nuclear in it. And of course, everyone said no. Um, she ran and said, right, please, can we have a, um, a working group to come up with recommendations? And uh, I was part of that working group. And, and one of the things we were able to do is to ask for um, IRP scenarios. And one of the things we just asked for at first was to say, can, can you please give us what the least cost IRP unconstrained scenario is? And when you got it, you got this plan that said we are closing you know, 29,000 megawatts of coal by 20. Uh, 39, and when at the time we were going to build about 150,000 megawatts of, of wind and solar, and I kind of looked and said, but that's, that's an energy transition. And as a developer, one would say, well, that's fantastic. But what you realised is, um, politically, that is a problematic process unless you have the right sets of interventions put in place, okay? At the time, and you'll often hear people will come out, and in fact, quite a few people from my industry will come out and talk about how renewables um, is the cheapest technology. However, we decided as a, as a small group of us that we, we had to start developing, I think, a more compelling value proposition for renewables than we are just cheap. Okay? And, and I think we, we realise that we face, firstly, there's a, a, what I would call a coal incumbency, I say coal has been a major contrib contributor to this, I would say, third industrial revolution minerals energy complex, and one cannot underestimate or undervalue the role that, that coal has played in, in economic development in this country. There is also a, a very much what I call a command and control mindset within government. They love central planning. They love the idea that everything should be controlled by ESCOM um, and government. Um, and, and ultimately, I think, ultimately, they see IPPs as something as something they don't kind of trust or, or understand too well. And you see that reflected in the way that ESCOM, for example, treated uh, us, the industry, particularly around the last rounds of REAP, where they delayed things for two to three years, and really around the policy and regulation that is still sitting that will sort of unlock a lot of those, um, a lot of the uh, projects that are sitting out there uh, outside of REAP. I think even you can say within REAP, it's very much a, a procurement process that, is, um, uh, that was put in place to deal with introducing IPPs into a monopoly, uh, I would say, environment and to give a lot of comfort to investors. I would say that's something that probably needs to change. And it, as I say, I think we need to find different models to, to get different outcomes in terms of ownership and actually active participation. And I think the other part is clearly that the energy transition, and as, as, I, as I said when I've talked to, to, to workers, is, is something that's going to require more highly skilled workers. To be fair, a lot of the jobs in this, I guess, forced industrial revolution space are jobs that we don't know of. Okay? So the issue of training and providing skills is, is actually something quite difficult in a world where maybe in 10 or 15 years' time we actually don't know what the jobs are going to be out there. Um, we kind of came up with this thing around, around, you know, what's an alternative view of the just energy transition. And for, for us, I'm not saying this is a, a right view, but this is, a, I think, a view from Sergio from our side, is that a lot of the fear is about how we transition away from, I would say, publicly owned um, sectors in certain cases. This can also apply to the water industry as well. Um, and to some extent, things that some, certain people regard either as a... Um, a basic human right or even as a public good, even though I don't think electricity um, fits into that. But it's how we transition essentially that sector from one that is predominantly owned by the state, I think, to one that is essentially, and we'll, I use a, a word called democratised, other people will say privatised, okay, and that you ensure that all people can participate, whether that's IPPs, you know, whether it's communities, whether it's labour, okay, and I think the one thing that we can look at is the fact that around the world there is certainly lots of different models that show that many people can participate. So very quickly, we came up with a plan, and, and to some extent it's, um, it's, it's one that's starting to get increased, um, let's say, support, and it's the, the issue around how can we, we industrialise this sector so that uh, renewables become, I think, relevant to people in the same way that coal has become relevant in people's lives. 
uh, don't worry, it's called the uh, Solar Industry Development Plan. It was kind of developed by, by me and, and the solar industry, but it's been adopted really by, I think, all the renewable um, associations now. So um, probably it needs to change to a renewable energy industrialization plan. Um, and essentially it was about how do we, how do we use um, renewable energy IPPs, but in a, in a kind of, I guess, located way, okay, to try and actually start to achieve greater impact. Renewable energy on its own cannot, cannot be a just energy transition. Okay? It can be a catalyst, I think, to allow for a just energy transition and probably more importantly to put in place just transition initiatives in terms of those socioeconomic training skills and, and support initiatives to, to ensure a just transition. But, but in very kind of simple practical terms, we wanted to come up with a plan that you could go to government and say, this is a just energy transition plan. And essentially what we've, what we've done is, um, and, uh, is we have these areas called Renewable Energy Development Zones, which is a, an, an outpouring out of the um, National Development Plan. It's under the Strategic Infrastructure Plan 8, where we've defined specific areas in South Africa where we want to see concentrated deployment of wind and solar. Um, one of the things that we have managed to persuade um, DEA is to place Renewable Energy Development Zones around Vitbank and around Clarksdorp. Again... The Just Energy Transition Plan isn't just about coal. It's also about gold. It can be about diamonds on the Richter's felt. Um, it can play a role in, in many other areas. But then within those areas is how we crowd in IPPs, okay? But then use it as, a, as I say, a catalyst, particularly, say, in Mpumalanga, is how do we bring together mining companies who know that within the next 10 or 15 years that those mines have to close, um, and have large um, SLP budgets, they have large uh, decommissioning, well, uh, rehabilitation budgets. How do you get ESCOM, who's closing uh, 29,000 megawatts of coal-fired plants, IPPs, local and district municipalities, and national government to come together with a plan that says over the next 20 years, we are going to migrate uh, a dying mining economy across to a mixed green sustainable economy. And, and ultimately, I'd say there's a whole list of things, and I think, I, I think I'm running out of time to probably talk about it, but, but we also see that it has the opportunity to play in things like water. We know that water is, is the next big problem coming up. Okay? The typical way of treating it is desalinization or reverse osmosis. That is about 40% of that cost is, is, is electricity. And so you can start to see how you can start to have interlinkages okay, between water, energy, food production, and, and I think sustainability. So, just a conclusion. I think we all know, everyone, I think it's been said probably better by the um, other speakers, we're on an energy transition already. They're not waiting for South Africa. Um, climate change means we have to fundamentally reconsider what our relationship is with coal. And I know that's a difficult and a, and a challenging thing. Social partners really need to unpack and reach real consensus about what a just energy transition and a just transition actually means. Um, we don't. We do it in silos, okay? And, and ultimately, we need to make a just energy transition plan that's actually going to provide opportunities for future generations rather than see it as a threat to our current generation. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.